Welcome to the 2023 Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, filmed on location at the IGFA and brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. You're about to learn from teams of some of the top saltwater fishing pros and how you really glean the most from the Saltwater Sports in the Seminar Series is listen for the little subtleties, the small things that we are doing to put together a great catch or to get a few fish when times are tough out there. So let's get right down to it and start off the Saltwater Sports in the National Seminar Series. Coming to you from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, it's the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series, brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Get ready, everybody. Here's George Poveromo. Welcome to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. We're at the IGFA, and the event is being presented by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. And we're bringing back Dr. John Stieglitz. We have Captain Bouncer Smith and Captain Mike Goodwine. Let's get right into it. Again, delving into the science as it relates to fishing, and this topic, so lunar tables and tides and how they influence our fishing. And I'm gonna jump into this one here and start it off. And so lunar tables, been around forever. You see them in the back of a lot of freshwater magazines. And the whole deal behind so lunar tables is that they predict certain times of a day when game, you know, on land game as well as fishes tend to be more aggressive in their feeding. In short, there are the major periods and they had the minors. And usually with the major, you have maybe about hour and a half to maybe two hours of a real good bite window. Uh, the minors about the same thing, maybe a little less time uh, on average. <clears throat> now, when you look at the lunar tables, the major periods, or when the moon is directly over you, above, or underneath you, directly below. That's the major period where fish tend to feed a little bit more aggressively. The minors are when the moon comes up and the moon goes down. And a lot of people still think that's just a bunch of myth, that it's not true. Well, one of the greatest things I ever did with fish predictions, we were doing a, a shoot for a camera crew from Sweden trying to catch swordfish in the daytime. So we get out there, it's beautiful, flat, calm, and we're not catching anything. And the guy comes over to me and says, okay, you said we'd have calmer weather, we'd have better fishing, where's the fish? I said, there's a major lunar period at 1.45 in the afternoon. 1.43, we hooked up, caught a fish, put it in the boat, and had two more bites. And then they quit biting again. So that night there was a swordfish tournament. Now there's 14 boats out there. Nobody's getting a bite. And the guy says, well, that was really good. When are they going to bite again? I says, quarter to nine. And sure enough, quarter to nine, people started hooking up. And we didn't get a bite. We didn't get a bite. And it was 9-10. We finally hooked up, tagged it and released it, and went home. There were several swordfish caught right there at that minor lunar period, right when the marine moon reached the horizon, and the rest of the night they didn't catch another fish, and right when the major was about to come on again, was the end of the fishing hours of the tournament, they all went home. All right, scientific aspect here with its lunar periods. Again, you've got the science background, you've got the angling background. What is your take on it, right, wrong, or indifferent? I think it absolutely has an impact, just like Bouncer said. I mean, this is something that's been fairly well established, right? People have gone through catch records for a number of different species and seen similar correlations with the sole lunar tables with these feeding periods. And you mentioned it, you know, applies to wild game as well, in terrestrial situations. And it's something the moon has a, a major impact on these animals' lives, right? And so these periods can absolutely help predict when you're going to see an increase in that feeding activity. Absolutely. And Mike over in Tampa, too, uh, you a believer in slowner periods or not? And feel free to disagree with us. It you know, won't, won't be the first time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I ain't a doctor, and I ain't got as many years as y'all got. <laughs> but I don't believe in it. I don't follow it. So it's just like we get up, we eat breakfast, and we eat lunch. In between, we might want to eat between. So I just, I've never based my fishing on it. Because it's just the fish could eat at any time. And if you base your fishing on that, 
then you might miss the one that, when they t say it suck, you might not be doing the right thing at that time. Well, and that's why, and Mike, hold the thought because we're going to go commercial break. We're going to come back. I'm going to find out a little bit more. We're going to dig deeper why you really hate this and don't believe in it. So, <laughs> yeah, where do you dig deep into your psych right after this commercial break? You're watching the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Simrad. Go with Simrad and go with confidence. Penn, let the battle begin. Roths, comprehensive oceanographic analysis for fishing. Mercury Outboards, go boldly. Angle, portable fridge freezers and high performance coolers. George will be right back. Welcome back to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. We're back to the Saltwater Sports National Seminar Series, so lunar tables and tides. And I'm working with Mike Goodwine to, to find out, dig deep to why he really doesn't believe in so lunar tables. And you had mentioned that a fish is like a human could eat any time, which is granted, but there's certain periods, I'll play point counterpoint with it, certain periods where we feed more aggressively, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? Even though we snack during the day. Yeah. Uh, how, how are you going to counter that? Yeah, how I could counter that is <laughs> we ain't a fish, though, you know. And it, he, I just I just don't believe in putting that much uh putting that much trust on a on a some that a man telling you they're going to eat good at this time <laughs> and that time. So at the end of the day, if you ain't doing the right thing on the mine, you ain't going to catch fish anyway. <laughs> so it's just you got to be you got to be in tune with what the fish are doing. And I just, all that, go fishing at this time, don't go fishing at this time. I'm a fish all day. Can I, I interject said. a thing in defense of Mike? A hundred percent. I was a charter boat captain for 54 sure. years. Mike's a charter boat captain. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what the saloon tables say. We have to entertain our people. Of course. For it, four, it, six, or you eight gotta hours. You got to be out there. Sure. You got to be out there. But the key thing, Mike, that you might want to try just to give an experiment is find out when the tables are, especially the miners. Miners are very intense. That's when the moon rises and sets. But find out when it is, and then make it a point that you always have good baits in the water when that miner is coming. Mm -hmm. And see if you don't find that you get a more intense bite. We were always reminded by John Callan, this is not the time to relocate this is a time to keep your line in the water for 15 more minutes because this is when they're most likely to bite. Or make sure you're at one of your favorite spots right. beforehand, knowing that this come off. And, and you segue into like the Wahoo, which is uh, a lot of times you hit that major minor to be right in the zones and working for those fish that turns them back on. And I'm going to come back in again to that example I gave with a largemouth bass playing around on those prefrontal conditions when they feed. And I've been watching them on these solunar periods. I'll walk a dock. <clears throat> and when you're off that period, you struggle to even get a hit. Now you come into a minor or you come into major, you start getting the feed more aggressively. You might get two, three, or four of them. And then you come off that period, there's something to it. But now I, I want to stay, it's not cut and dry. In other words, here you go. Okay, I'm going to fish on this minor period or this major period. There are a lot of other things that influence it, like weather, fronts, all the other things. But all things being equal, they do tend to produce. See, I, but I, ain't, I ain't trying to jump ahead, but we, I think we might be saying the same thing. But I base all my fishing off the tide. Bing, and the reason we're going to let you run with it, because you were right, because here's the magic and the rub of this whole thing. When you boil these salunar tables down, they co coincide with the changing of the okay, tides. Okay, yes. Then the majors and the minors are tide changes. So, okay. Mike, feel free now for redemption. Tell us about the tides. <laughs> now, I, I, I believe in the tides 100%, and, uh, and I've always had my best bite. Uh, like an hour before the top of the tide or an hour after it start dropping or at the bottom, either or. So I don't know, like I said, I ain't no doctor. <laughs> I've never tried to look and see if the minor was towards the end of the tide or, I mean, the major was towards the end of the tide or, or when the tide start to go out. I've never took that time to look and see 
where the minor and major lines up with the tide. So, I mean, maybe, maybe y'all have. I, I just follow the tide. Well, and I'm going to throw this one to John. And I'll bring up another example. Recently, I was fishing off of Isla Mirada in the Florida Keys with Andy Newman, who does the PR for the Florida Keys, and a buddy of his. We went out fun fishing. And we were around 600 or so feet of water. Weed lines were around. And it was just slow. And I knew that the major period that day was at 11. And I stayed in his zone, even though we weren't getting anything. It just looked good. You had some flyers, you had some weeds, or life under the weeds. And sure enough, we blitzed, I might have been three or four fish. And while Andy and his buddy were on a double header, another rod goes down. I was letting him do the fishing, but then I grabbed the extra rod. It was about a 28, 29 pound bull dolphin. And I checked back on the slooner dates. And again, I was dead on. It was right in that 11 o'clock time frame. Now, could those fish have just been migrating through and we happen to be near where they ate, or did that have something to do with it? And I'm going to come back to you after a commercial break because I'm going to ask you about the offshore and how does that affect those fish when it's a tide deal. We'll be right back with the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series right after a few commercial breaks. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Rapala, your best shot at a world record. Suffix, always use the best line. VMC, your expert in hooks. Williamson Lures for the Pelagic Playground. Starbright, blending technology with performance since 1973. George will be right back. Welcome back to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. Welcome back to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. The topic, lunar tables and tides. And I'm talking with Dr. John Steiglitz here. Now, here's the question. They coincide with the changing of the tides. Okay. So you can understand that philosophy with your inshore fish, stuck tarpon, redfish, striped bass. But how would the changing of the tides affect the offshore fishing where swords would come on the bite, where you would get the mahi on the bite when you're that far off? Is it a pressure gradient that happens during a tide change that provokes or entices offshore fish to fight. There's, there's the rub. How do you explain that? Right. So it's all connected together, right? It's a complex system. So you've got the moon there. You've got your tide, tidal influence. A lot of people, you'll, you'll hear them say, oh, the tides don't have any impact on offshore fishing. It's incorrect, right? We all know that if you're going wahoo fishing, having that outgoing tide can really turn on the bite, right? And so having some fish like moving water, right? And so if you're fishing the drop off and you have an outgoing tide, washing a lot of bait fish and other stuff off that bank, you're gonna have a good feeding opportunity for the fish. And again, to play devil's advocate with you on that. Okay, you had given relatively close offshore destinations, Bahamas, South Florida, the Florida Keys, where that water movement could definitely affect those offshore fisheries close by. How do you explain the bite on a major or minor 100 miles off of Jersey in the canyons or somewhere out there where you, you're not going to be, at least I don't believe, any kind of that near shore or inshore movement of water could influence such. What's happening out there? Right, I think that's trigger. more of what we talked about earlier in terms of the sole lunar tables, in terms of those major and minor periods, right? Okay. So that might not be a necessarily the fish is experiencing the tidal movement, but it's experiencing the difference in that pull from the moon. That's right? what I want. So is, that is, is it a pressure gradient or they feel that pull from the moon that triggers? That's right. the I got to mention something about all this stuff. You're talking about way offshore and stuff. The first person to introduce me to slunar effects didn't know anything about it being slunar effects. But my dad and I used to go bass fishing in Okeechobee quite a bit. And my dad would say, Oh, fish hard, to, all the cows are standing up. And then you'd have some good fishing action and the fishing would slow down. And my dad said, yep, there go all the cows are laying down. The salooner tables were influencing those bass and those cows. Sure. And cows don't have tide. No, and, and, if the, and they use salooners way back for hunting when the game would be more productive and roaming at certain time frames. And, you know, it's a perfect example, but, you know, when you, put, you talk offshore fishing and cows, you see cows out there, we just came through a bad hurricane. <laughs> <laughs> there are sea cows, you know. <laughs> it's true. Huh? Bite, bite to what his dad said, when I'm 
pulling out from, from under my pole barn. Every morning I pull out, and then some rabbits. If I see them rabbits running across, I'm like, all right, the bite gonna be good. And when I hit the road, we got cows to the right. I see the cows standing up, same thing. So some of us old school, we just look at nature. You do, and you watch out there too, the birds, everything else is active too. There's more bird activity, they're feeding, and what telltale sign is when the mosquitoes get all over you. When they're really biting good, the, you know, serious, the fish is spray your down one more off yourself too, but there's a correlation to all that nature getting triggered by this too. So it's, uh, it's really a fine line with that. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna segue out to a commercial break and we'll get a little bit more deeper into that as well as how the tides, you know, we're talking salooner tables, but let's have a good hard look at the tides and their driving force and how it affects each and every one of your fishing. You're watching the Saltwater Sports from National Seminar Series. We're coming right back, right after a few commercials. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series is brought to you by Atlas Tracks, satellite tracking of recreational pleasure boats, supply vessels, and fishing fleets. Columbia Sportswear, stay cool and protected while fishing. JL Audio, ahead of the curve. ACR, building survival products since 1956. Florida Keys and Key West, visit FLAKeys.com. George will be right back. Welcome back to the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series from the IGFA in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. Let's get right back to George. Welcome back to the Saltwater Sports for National Seminar Series, filmed on location at the IGFA, brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Mako Boats. All right, let's segue into the tides. Okay, All right, tides move water. Moving water generally stimulates feeding. But let me make an observation on that. I did a lot of fishing in haul over and government cut. You don't say. Just a couple of days. But as an example, on the slack tide, when the tide was stopped, when the water stopped running, the tarpon and the snook would both wander all over the place, helter skelter, and there wasn't a lot of feeding going on. As soon as the tide starts to run, the first part of the moving tide, everything stages up and there's a feeding period. And then the current gets real, real strong and they're just locked into position and it's hard to get a bite. I don't, I don't know how much of it's the bait presentation, but it gets very hard to get a bite on the ripping tide. But then the tide starts to slow down and everything turns on again, whether it's the tarpon, the snook, the permit, mangrove snappers, whatever it is, they all feed again real good until the tide stops and then they slow down again. I think I said that. <laughs> Did you say yeah. that? Okay. So it ain't got anything to do with the minor or major. It's Another the beginning of the ending. Y'all remember that. <laughs> Another thing that we all know about the tides is that whether it's government cut, haul over cut, wherever it is, on an outgoing tide, you may have an area where the fish stage up and feed really good. But on the incoming tide, those fish move to a whole new area. Example, government cut, the, tar the snook would be in the, ch not in the channel, but between the jetties, up on the shelf, on the outgoing tide. Any, any one particular side or both? Uh, it would vary with the time of year and everything else, but, but they would be up on the shelf close to the rocks, and they would feed really good on the beginning and the bottom of the outgoing tide. Conversely, on the incoming tide, they go on the outside of the rocks, because on the outgoing tide, the water was bringing all the food to them in the channel. On the incoming tide, the water would run down the beach and go around the jetty. So all the food was coming to them on the other side of the rocks. So tide not only determines something about when they're going to feed, but also where they're going to feed. Gonna, where they're going to be, because I got a, it's an island that I pass every day. And when the tide is coming in, I like to, it's some real big snook that sit there that's almost impossible to catch. So I tell my clients, hey, go get up in front of the deck and then say, this is the island and we going this way. Those snook, big snook is gonna be sitting right here every single time. And then once the tide flip and we coming from out of there, I have them get on the front of the boat going out and those snook move to the other side. And when the tide is going out, they get on this side of it. So they move back and forth, like he said, with the tide. 
So you get the, your moon phases, and on a full moon, more water is being moved. That should increase the velocity of the tides, which theoretically should make it a lot harder to fish during the teeth of that. Am I correct? Or wrong? Right. I mean, fish are looking for the easiest feeding opportunity with the least amount of energy expended, right? So when bouncer is talking about, okay, during the hardest part of the tide, they're kind of hunkered down, holding their spot, that makes sense, right? So it doesn't make sense to use their energy to try and eat a bait fish passing by or a shrimp, whereas when it eases up a little bit, they still have the feeding opportunity, but they have to use less energy now. And, and guess what, gentlemen? We had just come to the end of a major salooner period. This session is over. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank Dr. John Staglitz, Captain Bouncer Smith, Captain Mike Goodwine for that session. You're watching the Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series. We're coming back with a brand new course shortly. There you have it. The Saltwater Sportsman National Seminar Series will be right back next week with a totally different episode. If you want a chance to win our Super Grand Prize Mako 17 Pro Skiff Center Console, powered by Mercury Outboard, enter the drawing at nationalseminarseries.com. One lucky winner will take home this beautiful Mako boat. Best of luck.